I'm going to talk a little bit about FDA enforcement. So I spent about eight years um, in-house with Medtronic, um, and then prior to that with Hogan, what used to be Hogan and Hartson, so um, big law firm in D.C. And I um, have spent most of my time doing compliance and enforcement work. So I'm kind of the lawyer that shows up when everything is swirling down the toilet um, to try and help get things back on track. So most of my time is spent working on inspections, warning letters, consent decrees, um, you name it, most of the things that people don't really want to talk about and certainly don't want to be involved in. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about what we're seeing um, coming out of FDA from an enforcement standpoint. Um, about four to five years ago, FDA had a huge push of, of hiring brand new investigators out in the field. And so there was a period where there was an army of investigators that were still learning to do their job. Um, now we're seeing that they know what they're doing, they're out there, and they are um, inspecting firms um, left and right, and actually doing a pretty good job of it. I mean, from my perspective, there's nothing more painful than having an investigator who doesn't really know what they're looking for, but they're kind of just digging. It's um, much better when you have an investigator who knows what's worth digging into and what's worth passing over, because they've seen it before and they're pretty well experienced. So, you know, the vast majority of FDA's inspections are sort of ordinary course, every everyday inspections, um, abbreviated baselines, which are sort of their normal scheduled inspections. Um, the ones I'm going to talk about probably more so are the compliance follow-ups and the directed for cause inspections, because those, those are the ones that are most um, scary for industry. And then the high risk ones are the ones that FDA decides based on what they're seeing in their data, um, they need to focus in on. So for example, every year they will come out with what are our priorities from an enforcement standpoint? What are the products that we're most concerned about? And that's that 1%. So um, last year was interesting. There were a lot of, um, they've been looking at international firms quite a bit. This is the 2013 data. Unfortunately, the 2014 data is not quite out yet from FDA. It comes out kind of sometime about now. Um, but I checked yesterday and still not available. So China's no big surprise that they were, they did quite a few inspections in China, um, particularly since they now have an office there. Um, we were surprised to see Germany hit the top of the list. Um, Ireland's no surprise that it's a top 10 um, but you know you typically in the UK um, in Europe the EU doing a lot of inspections there so when FDA goes in and does their standard garden variety inspection, they will always look at CAPA, they will look at your production process controls, and they've been spending a lot of time looking at design. Um, because there's a belief within the agency that a lot of the recalls that I'm going to talk about in a sec are based on poor design or poor design control in the process of designing the device. So they're spending a lot of time digging around in companies' design files. So. Um, a lot of untitled letters out there. Unfortunately, folks don't get the opportunity to read those and, and kind of read the tea leaves about what's in them and what really it means underneath. Um, but there's also a lot of warning letters. Um, and there's some things that we're seeing in warning letters as they come up. So untitled letters, they are things that FDA tends to have some concern about, um, but don't necessarily rise to the level of what they would consider a true violation that they need to issue you a warning letter. Um, whereas in warning letters, th those have gotten to the point where FDA wants to send you a letter and say, you are violating. We think you have violated, your product's adulterated, you're misbranded. Um, and we're seeing some interesting things in those warning letters. Um, the first one is um, request for third-party certification audits, which used to be something that we only saw in consent decrees of permanent injunction, but they've now made their way into warning letters. And what that means is FDA is tired of coming in and auditing your firm, so they want somebody else to do the work for them. So they will have you hire an independent third-party expert to come in and do inspections for a number of years. Um, and then that data all goes to FDA. And so they actually don't come back in to inspect you, typically, until that whole series is done and they feel like you've gotten yourself back into compliance. Um, typically what we're seeing is a three-year, two to three-year requirement um, with different intervals. And FDA will specify what are your intervals? How often do you have to be audited? When do you have to send us the report? Um, and it's kind of like getting a warning letter because you have to respond, or you should respond, in the same way as you would to a warning letter. 
Um, when you get a warning letter, FDA will stop issuing your CFGs, so you can't get the certificates you need to export product. We are actually seeing the CFGs bleed into um, 483s. So if you get a really bad 483, you actually will see CFGs start to stop, depending on what your observations are. Um, we have seen FDA come back to companies and say, we see you've done a lot of work, we've seen all of your corrective action, we've seen all of your data, but now we want to see your effectiveness check, which is something that companies didn't use to send to FDA. You used to send your um, objective evidence and then kind of close it out and move on. But now FDA is saying, no, no, we want to see that your corrective actions really worked, which then creates a longer tail in your sort of closing out all of your actions. Um, we've seen them demand shipping restrictions, um, asking companies to voluntarily put product on hold. Um, it's sort of one of those requests that you can't really refute, uh, refuse unless you have a really good basis for it. Um, we've also seen FDA demand recall in the letter. It's not quite what I would call um, an order to recall, but it's a very um, sternly worded request that you recall product. So, the, and these are things we didn't used to see in warning letters. You know, it used to be, you get a warning letter, they tell you what they think is wrong, you tell them what you're gonna do to fix it, you do it, and then you move on. So, um, in the warning letters, kind of the same top players in terms of quality system elements that are getting um, cited. Production and process controls how you manufacture and control your product. Kappa, all roads lead to Kappa. And then design controls, because they, they believe that design is a real problem with industry. Which gets a little bit into, um, I think, whoops. Well, let, actually, let's go to enforcement summary. So these are the numbers for overall for FDA in terms of what they did in 2013. Seizures, and then I gave you the device component of it, because that's what's probably most interesting to this group. No seizures, so that's good. Um, they did go after an injunction in 2013. Lots of warning letters, lots of recalls. Debarment is a clinical trial issue that's not really a device issue for clinical investigators. But this is sort of a summary. They've been very busy. Um, um, at FDA. So recalls, um, FDA has been very active in the recall space, um, both with voluntary recalls and then the recalls that I will call the um, request that you take a recall, even if you don't particularly want to, but you really ought to if they actually ask you to, recalls. And what they're doing is they've been trying to give some guidance around what is actually a recall um, and what is really a device enhancement, which was sort of, sort of helpful, but not really. But the other thing that's coming out of the recall space is they're getting a lot more 510Ks out of companies when they make improvements to their products. Um, in fact, we've been dusting off FDA's old, like 1987 guidance document on special 510Ks for corrective actions being affected, which is, I've got to take a recall, I've got to change my product, I realize I have to do a 510K, can you give me enforcement discretion so I can launch my recall while you review the 510K? So it's an old, old, old guidance document and we've actually been using it quite a bit to get to the point we can launch recalls. So they're very, very busy on recalls. Um, and then the other big thing kind of on the enforcement compliance side is MDRs. Um, over the past six years, um, the Office of Surveillance and Biometrics has been incredibly busy dealing with companies doing warning letter remediation work on MDRs. So you realize you should have been submitting MDRs darn it, you weren't. So you fix your process going forward and you go back and look at every file for the past two years and you submit all of those MDRs. Um, so they are, uh, they've been very busy dealing with all of those retrospective MDRs, um, but in the next year we're going to have electronic MDR reporting. And what that's really going to do, um, hopefully if it works well, is it's actually going to give FDA a great source of data. Because what they've got is their mini sentinel program, which they're using to mine the data and identify issues in products. And so when you look at the MDR database, I mean, it's a huge treasure trove of information about product problems, but when it's all electronic, it takes away the data entry step that FDA's been doing, and they can actually just mine that data, which gets us back to um, it being a feeder for FDA's post-market surveillance programs. So they take 
take all of that data, they mine it, and then they decide who they're going to go out and visit on inspection. Bo both from a, we'll just put this issue into your next annual inspection or your biannual inspection, or we see something that we're, we find so troubling, we actually need to reach out to you or we're going to come out and inspect on it. So we're seeing a lot more inspections that are triggered by MDR data. So that's it. When there, is there any further data on what they're seeing with the design control audits that they're doing? So I can probably tell you just anecdotally. I don't. I haven't. Um, I don't have in my head sort of the drill down on the design controls. I think there are. There's a couple of things. There are companies who have long-standing products that have been in the market for many, many years. So you develop those things in 1992, prior to design controls coming into play, and so you've got. I mean, not great design files. And so while there may have been work, iterative work since then, at the end of the day, your base file's not great. And so there, there's a good deal of that out there. Um, and then there's one issue that we're seeing a lot is design validation. So gaps in design validation. You know, you go all the way back to your design requirements, your design inputs, your design plan, and you realize that there are gaps in your validation. Those are sort of anecdotally what seems to be coming up quite a bit.